Okay, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Are you guys ready to, uh, are you in the mood for love? Well, how about sex? So, okay, I was asked to talk about my research. So most of these science cafes are about research. And they said, and it's on Valentine's Day, and I thought, I work on ice worms. We know nothing about their love life. It would be inappropriate to talk about ice worms tonight. So I thought, why not talk about sex? And because we're on Puget Sound, why don't we talk about sex in the sea? So I'm an evolutionary biologist. And the thing that makes th thinking about sex interesting for me is that when you start thinking about the costs and benefits of why organisms have sex, why they do what they do, that's the thing that makes it really interesting. So what I'm going to try to do is look at sex through an evolutionary lens in addition, in, in addition to telling titillating, maybe even prurient stories. So children, they're going to be some videos. They're not human videos, but they're kind of prurient especially if you're a duck. So the talk really won't be a Kama Sutra of animal sex, but <laughs> it'll be close. Okay, so sex in the sea, right? Sex is better in the water. It's better in the sea. And why is that? So a lot of these organisms end up using the water sort of as this medium, it really helps them do what they do. So it's denser than air, it's supportive. The sea is slightly salty, and it's wet, so it prevents drying out of gametes, for instance. The other thing that makes the sea a great place for organisms, especially organisms that spew their gametes, and we'll talk about that, is that they're currents. And these currents can transport gametes and larvae around Puget Sound, for instance, so this is a little cross-section of Puget Sound right here. And it can transport larvae and gametes sort of around the sound so they can basically meet or they can settle in place, the larvae can settle in places they need to go. So when we think about sex, which we probably do all the time, um, it turns out that almost all organisms have sex. About 99% Point nine percent of organisms have sex at some point during their life cycle. So everything from bacteria, there's bacterial sex where they exchange genes through through little pillus, and to the largest animal alive, blue whales. They all have sex. But to a biologist, the definition of sex is kind of boring. What is sex to a biologist? Sex really has to do with the fusion of gametes and then meiosis, or essentially the splitting apart of chromosomes. But it's a real puzzle why so many organisms have sex, because sex is expensive. So there are a lot of obvious reasons why you might think that sex would entail a cost. So for instance, finding a partner takes time. Finding a partner and maybe even having sex, takes energy. While you're doing it, you're definitely at greater risk of predation because your mind may not quite be there, right? There's a risk of disease. So sexually transmitted diseases occur in all organisms. And then you might spend all this time and energy, take all these risks, and your partner may be infertile, right? So why have sex? Why not just Make little clones of yourself and be asexual. But there's even a greater cost of sex. So evolutionary biologists ended up thinking about what would happen in a population where you just had asexual, you had some asexual individuals and then you had some individuals who were sexual. So let's imagine a small population. We've got two females. One of them is asexual, makes more copies of herself and another one requires a male to inseminate her, and then she ends up, each one of them produces two offsprings. The sexual female produces a male and a female, and the asexual female just produces females. Over every generation, the asexual female produces twice as many offspring-bearing offspring as does the sexual individual. And so this is called the twofold cost of sex. 
That is a huge cost in evolutionary terms. Selection should really act against sexual individuals. But I just said 99.9% .9 of individual or species have sex at some point during their life cycle. <coughs> there are two main reasons why evolutionary biologists think sex is so ubiquitous among organisms. The first is that if you think about the environment that organisms live in, an uh, important part of that environment are pathogens and predators, especially pathogens. They're a daily selective force that we're dealing with. It turns out that pathogens are evolving to evade a host's immune defenses, and the hosts are, evading, are evolving to evade the pathogen's defenses. So you have this constant evolutionary arms race that sort of never ends. And one evolutionary biologist, Lee Van Valen, called this idea that maybe generating genetic variation in this responding to biological selection pressures, he called it the Red Queen hypothesis. So just like in Through the Looking Glass, where um, the Red Queen says to Alice, now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. So basically, according to this, evolution is always happening, but organisms aren't sort of, they're not evading these pathogens, they're basically, or the pathogens aren't sort of all of a sudden dominating. It's this give and take, this evolutionary arms race. So there's one other reason that sex is thought to be really prominent, and that it turns out that through meiosis, essentially deleterious mutations can be purged, whereas asexual individuals, those deleterious mutations will build up generation after generation, ultimately reducing their fitness. So, what are males in the, big, in the larger scheme of things? We're essentially these vehicles to transport sperm, right? So we're basically sperm bags. So <laughs> anglerfish, a lot of you may, have, may know about anglerfish, but anglerfish take this idea of males as sperm bags to the extreme. So here is, I'm going to show you a few different pictures of anglerfish. Anglerfish live uh, sort of mid-pelagic deep sea. They are called anglerfish because they have this lure that often, ha that often lights up, attracts prey, they have a large mouth, and they gulp the prey up. For a long time, people thought that there were no males in anglerfish. And there were these different, they basically said they're these big species. And then in fish collections, Things that looked like this were also collected, and they were called different species. It turns out that these little guys right here are males. So these lar basically these larval males, they find a female, they attach to the female, and their nervous system, their um, circulatory system completely fuses with the female. And they devote all their energy to turning their bodies into little, basically little bags of sperm. So they end up being parasites on the female. And they're, all they do is they live to release their sperm. So anglerfish are one example of this. It turns out that there are numerous examples. Another one that you probably haven't heard of are green spoonworms. So green spoonworms belong to an obscure phylum called Echiura. They're the... Um, Proboscis worms. And in green spoonworms, sex is environmentally determined. So they, these larvae come out, and as they mature, they start turning into a female. But if a larva ends up encountering a female or a chemical being released by the female called benelin, the larva turns into a male. That little male then ends up attaching to the female onto her proboscis. She sucks him in. She, he's about one to three millimeters in size. And then he spends the rest of his life blowing sperm through his mouth to fertilize her eggs. So here we have another sort of example of a, a male that basically has been reduced to nothing but its rep his reproductive function. So. <laughs> He, he, lived, he basically creates this little structure that's called an andresium, and if you translate that, it could be little man house, but now we could translate it into man cave. So, so a lot of organisms have life cycles where part of the time they're sexual. They have maybe sex at 
once or even less often during, the, during their life. And then they're asexual for long, long periods of time where they're basically creating cl little clones of themselves. So diatoms are these beautiful, beautiful marine phytoplankton. So they're photosynthetic. They have these little silica shells. If you look at the white cliffs of the white herd of the white cliffs of Dover, those are basically fossil diatoms. If you've used diatomaceous earth to filter water, it is the skeletons, it's the silica skeleton of diatoms. They're one of the most abundant organisms on earth. They provide most of the photosynthesis in the ocean. So diatoms spend most of their life making little copies of themselves. And the way they do it is if you look at these silica oops, if you look at these silica tests, what happens is there's a larger half and a smaller half. They're kind of like little pill boxes. When they reproduce asexually, they split apart and they make a new half of a test. So what, in, what ends up happening over time is they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller through the year. When fall comes around, they, environmental conditions are more variable and they end up undergoing sex. They produce gametes, the gametes fuse, make a zygote, that settles down and then it will start developing and will be a big diatom again the following spring. So when conditions are stable, so remember we talked about how sex was advantageous in especially to adapt to varying em environments. So in these guys, when environmental conditions are pretty stable, they end up being asexual, 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 making tons of offspring, and then when things get a little more variable, they end up going sexual and wait till the next year. Jellyfish also are one of the only animals that um, really have this life cycle that includes sort of both sexual reproduction, where they make gametes, which aren't on this. So the gametes should be right in here, form a zygote. And then they end up forming these polyps, which are sessile. And those polyps then often end up producing almost, they're like little disks, and they start blebbing off these little disks. And these disks are all identical. And that's what ends up turning into the jellyfish that you see. So basically, again, you've got when sort of at the beginning of summer or in spring, they s go asexual. They produce all these identical individuals. They don't have to worry about finding a mate all summer long. And then finally, um, at the end of summer, those medusae start spewing gametes. So if we look at a lot of invertebrates, a lot of invertebrates out there are sessile, meaning they're stuck to the ground. So things like sea anemones, things like coral, sponges, starfish, not that modal. They can move around. Sea urchins, barnacles, okay? So how do most of these guys reproduce, right? They're not out running around. They're not going to bars to pick up other coral. I guess the question is how to have sex if you're a couch potato or a sponge or a couch sponge. <laughs> so it turns out that most of them, not all of them, and we'll talk about an important exception, are they spew their gametes. So basically Puget Sound it, at various times of the year is full of gametes. So think about that when you're swimming. <laughs> um, often they live close to other individuals, but not always. So they make tons of gametes, and these gametes often are adapted to survive for relatively long periods of time in the water column looking for another gamete, right? And a, a lot of times, in, mo in, a, in most cases, these gamete spewers synchronize their spewing. So they all, it may be related to tide, it may be related to lunar cycle, um, but they, they end up spewing their gametes at the same time to increase the chances that they're actually gonna find a partner. Sometimes even the presence of gametes um, leads, to, leads to this kind of bright, this kind of group spawning. So fish do it, so fish often will aggregate they w some fish are gamete spewers. They will get in big groups. 
Sometimes they'll even court in these big groups. They'll swim up, they'll re release their gametes, and uh, do it that way. But sponges, corals, they can't do that. So one of the questions you might ask is, how does a gamete know when it has met the right gamete, right? So you might think, oh, there's, you know, molly mussel is out there, and you've got the starfish gamete and the sea urchin gamete. So, and you might, for instance, in Puget Sound, you might have three different species of sea urchin gametes floating around. So how do they actually know which gamete to bind with? So it turns out that on the coat of the gametes are, are various proteins, and those proteins end up basically being species recognition markers. So when a sperm of a green sea urchin meets the egg of a green sea urchin, the bindin, which is the, the protein, ends up mediating the fusion of the sperm and the egg, and then you have fertilization occurring. In abalones, lysin, turns out, is the protein. In a lot of mollusks, lysin is the protein. And here's a mystery. So it's you, we know it's used for species recognition, that abalones basically use this lysin. It's different between species. But when we look at lysin across abalone species, lysin is one of the fastest evolving proteins that we know of. It's, it evolves faster than immune system proteins, which are under constant uh, selection from pathogens. Why is it so fast? We have no idea. So that's something you can... You can figure out, okay? Okay, another, another uh, gamete. This, these guys, the males will end up releasing their sperm. Females release the eggs. And usually in most animals, once a single sperm has entered the egg, the eggs create this jelly capsule and they prevent any other sperm from entering. Okay, so basically one sperm fertilizes the egg. In tenophores, or comb jellies, the eggs end up letting multiple sperm in. And then there are videos where you can see the nucleus in the egg actually moving around, and it looks like the nucleus is doing some kind of assessment and ends up choosing a sperm and then fusing with that chosen sperm inside the egg. Okay, we're going to start getting a little more exciting than gamete spewing. If we think about invertebrates, if we think about a lot of animals, a lot of animals end up being both male and female at the same time, which is great, right? Because then you, you, know, you can find anybody and you'll be happy. <laughs> Some hermaphrodites are simultaneous hermaphrodites, which means that they're male and female at the same time. And some species are sequential hermaphrodites. For instance, like the flatworm that I told you about, there's different ways of being sequential. You can either be a boy first or you can be a girl first. And depending on the costs of making eggs or the ability to mate when you're a male or a female at a certain size, that may end up impacting what, whether you're protandrous, which is boy first, or protogenous, which is girl first. So let's talk about some, a simultaneous hermaphrodite. Hamlets are coral reef fish. They're male and female, same time. And they end up getting together. They do these little dances. And what they end up doing is they end up mating and taking turns being male and female, male and female. So sperm is cheap, right? Sperm is small. You can produce a lot of it. Eggs are much more expensive. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. It turns out that if a hamlet decides that it's not going to make many eggs, the other hamlet says, I'm done. You're not, you're not investing enough energy. I'm out of here. So another example of simultaneous hermaphrodites are flatworms. So in some flatworms, they end up mating, and they end up basically giving and getting at the same time. So they're not taking turns. They're just both doing it, but being male and female at the same time. In Macrostoma lignano, this one species, they have a urogenital pore, and thanks, I don't know if Mary Krauser is here. Mary Krauser told me about this the other day. It's a great little story. So the flatworms mate, and these flatworms are prolific mating, maters. They mate multiple times. When they're done, the female, or the female, the flatworm, 
may decide that she actually doesn't like the, the guy that she just mated with. And she'll basically bend over and she'll suck out the sperm that he deposited in her. So she basically has fertilized some eggs. She's increased her fitness, but she's trying to basically increase her fitness more by finding a higher quality male. Well, one thing that as we know goes on is that there is what's called sexual conflict in that male and female interests are not always the same. So in these flatworms, what we see is that males have evolved a counteradaptation. Their sperm has backward pointing barbs. It's very big. So once it gets into a urogenital tract, it's really hard to suck out. <laughs> so here in a closely related species, these guys do a different kind of mating that we'll talk about. It's basically called traumatic insemination. And I just, here, take a look at this and remember this. This is their stylet or penis, and it's got this hook on it. So they're going to end up penetrating the body wall of a flatworm and their sperm is not barbed, it's much smaller. And so you can see, sort of evolution is acting on these guys, selection is acting on these guys to basically maximize reproductive success. Okay, banana slugs are not marine. But I had to talk about them. So banana slugs, you've seen them in the forest around here. So they're also simultaneous hermaphrodites. And banana slugs do something that still is puzzling to biologists. So they mate, both being male and female at the same time. And when they're done, in s some of the cases, one of the banana slugs ends up chewing off the penis of the other one to get away. And it doesn't grow back. So it's not clear what the effects of that, it's called apophilation, what, th what the effects of that. So. Do banana slugs that lack a penis, are they less successful at finding mates in future mating seasons? We don't really know. So, okay, let's talk about hermaphroditism where either males or females come first. So, sequential hermaphrodites, protandry, boys first. So that means that during development, you first turn into a boy and then you turn into a girl. When might that make sense? Well, it might make sense if you can produce a lot more eggs when you're big, but maybe you can still get matings when you're small if you're a male. So slipper limpets, crepidula, which you can find in Puget Sound around the San Juans, the males are smaller, and you get this pile of limpets with the largest one on the bottom being the female, and then you get this successive size with all of these guys being male. When, that lar when, the largest, when the female dies, the largest male ends up turning into a female and the process continues. So in some fish, we end up finding girls first. So for instance, blue-headed wrasses and a number of other wrasses end up changing sex. They first are female and then they're male. And if you might think about why this is. So it turns out that the larger males can hold territories. Those territorial males are much more successful at garnering matings than smaller males are. So if you can make babies while, let's say, you're small as a female, then go ahead and do that. And then once a male, let's say, vacates a territory or whatever, the, often the largest female may end up taking over that territory and turning into a male. And one thing that's interesting in blue-headed grass is they're often smaller bands of males looking for opportunistic matings, and they basically rove around like teenage boys in these big schools looking for unguarded females. Some hermaphrodites just switch back and forth and back and forth. So there's one sessile polychaete. A big worm is a female. But as she produces tons and tons of eggs, she's basically spending her reserves, her growth rate slows, and basically she turns into a male, and then she'll turn into a female again. So basically, an individual is going back and forth and back and forth from male to female during its life, depending on how much energy it has. 
So in thinking about sex and mating, one of the sort of basically one of the sort of theoretical umbrellas or, or one of the frameworks in which to think about it is that individuals, right, surviving is great. So natural selection acts on things that increase survival. But one of the things that Darwin and Wallace, sort of the co-proposer of natural selection, both noticed was that there are some traits that just make no sense. For instance, the big tail of a peacock makes no sense if you're just thinking about survival. But if you think about that an individual really may as well be functionally dead if it leaves no offspring, then traits that are going to increase the probability of mating are going to be favored as well. And so that's sexual selection. It's interesting that Darwin thought that there were two kinds of sexual selection. He thought that there was male-male competition, and he thought that there was female choice, right? So females actually could choose. Wallace, and as did a lot of people then, thought that females did not have sort of the mental capacity actually to make that kind of conscious choice, and they were just basically passive recipients of male choice. So why do we see in a lot of species, why do we see females? So if you think about birds, for instance, we think of bright males and we think about drab females, we think about females choosing and we think about the males, you know, maybe being sort of mating profligately. So if I gave everybody down here a dollar, right, and I said you could invest it in one, let's say one stock, okay? And I gave all the people in the back of the room and you guys over here, I gave you $10,000 and I said you could invest it in one stock. Which group do you think would spend on average more time considering where they're going to invest that money? Probably the $10,000 ones. And it's the same thing with the investment in gametes. Female gametes are big. In some cases, they're stuck with them for a while because, let's say, they're, they're carrying offspring. In some cases, they provide parental care. And it turns out that because sperm are relatively easy to produce, relatively cheap, Males end up being less concerned about who they inseminate, just that they inseminate, whereas females end up being much more choosy because they have limited reproductive success during their lifetime. So one saying is sperm is cheap, eggs are dear. So what kinds of things do we see as a result of this? So we see male-male competition. So for instance, in, elephants, oh, in elephant seals, we might see males that are 4,000 pounds, females that are maybe around less than 1,000. We see battles that can lead to really severe wounds. So in elephant seals, the dominant male often gets 70% of the matings in a given year in a given area. We can get intersexual selection, so female choice, but it's not always female choice. What's interesting is that in fish, because they often, they release their gametes and they're not stuck with them like birds, there can be situations where females actually end up being the sex that is chosen and the males end up being ch the choosy ones. And so in seahorses where the males actually brood the young, the males are choosing females and not vice versa. There's actually some choice going on both ways, but um, males are choosy in seahorses. Fiddler crabs are a great example of both things going on. So male claws and fiddler cla crabs are used to tell males that they're studly, that this territory is mine, so you have these territorial battles. But females are also using those claws as indicators of choice. But in at least some species, it turns out that mating ends up happening in these burrows, and it turns out that in some species, it's actually the size of the burrow that ends up being more important than the size of the claw. <laughs> so it's the crib, not the nib. Okay, so now we'll, I decided since we're talking in a bar, we could talk about penises, because penises are funny. Okay, so penises are associated with internal fertilization, right? So all of these critters that I've told you about, these gamete spewers, they don't have any external gel genitalia. They just basically spew the gametes. So if you think about penis morphology, which I don't know that anybody really has here, but... It turns out that penis morphology, as you look across animals, is the result of both inter- and intrasexual selection, as well as sexual conflict. So I'm just going to tell a few stories 
that are more or less marine and uh, think about what kinds of selective pressures there are on fertilization. So it turns... One thing that's interesting is many internally fertilized animals, like birds, for instance, most birds do not have penises. A lot of reptiles don't have penises, right? But they're internally fertilized. Um, they do, birds do what's, so birds have a cloaca, sort of a urogenital opening that everything comes out of, and uh, they do a little cloacal kiss. But we'll get to the one exception. So barnacles. Let's start with barnacles. Barnacles are sessile animals, right? So they're stuck to the ground, and they don't spew their gametes. So they've got these larvae that are modal. So what happens with a barnacle? Barnacles are arthropods, or crustaceans, okay? So they're related to crabs and shrimp. So the larvae look a lot like other crustacean larvae. When they settle, a barnacle larvae basically sticks its head to the ground, and then it deposits this shell around it, and it uses one of its feet, right? So if you imagine standing on your head, you could actually use one of your feet as a feeding structure. And so the feeding structure of a barnacle is its foot. They don't spew gametes, so how do they mate? So their ancestors are, all, are internally fertilized, right? So th they have lost these large, sort of larger gametes, gametes that are adapted to floating around in the water. In re-evolving all of those special the specializations that allow gametes to float around in the water is not something that just happens overnight. So they're stuck with, it turns out that they're stuck with internal fertilization as well. So what to do? You make use of what you got. These guys have penises. They settle next to each other. Barnacles are simultaneous hermaphrodites, so they're male and female at the same time. And barnacles, I forgot one of my props. I was going to bring my garden hose here. Some barnacles have penises that are 10 times their body length, which is about the length of a garden hose to us. And what they do in these groups is they basically probe other, other individuals and look for, you know, the male part is looking for receptive females, and uh, they end up basically mating like that. One of the unfortunate things for barnacles is that fish will come by and graze off their penises sometimes. So that kind of takes care of the male function. So another thing that's really interesting is, so here you can see the water is very calm. This is, a, this is in an aquarium. Is that if you look at the morphology of barnacle penises within a species, it's also impacted by the environment they live in. So barnacles that live in a wave-swept shore end up having sort of short, stout, or shorter, or stouter penises, whereas Barnacles that live in still, undisturbed places tend to have long and thin ones. So this, the lesson here is that organisms are stuck with what they have. Selection acts on what's there, right? So in the case of barnacles, they didn't have spewable gametes, but they did have a penis. Natural selection acted on that. They're constrained by their history, right? So they've got these millions of years of history of internal fertilization behind them. They can't escape that. So when we think about what happens in sort of evolution, what we see are opportunities for innovation, and we also see constraints that are imposed on what's possible. And we can see remarkable adaptations, right? It's not a new structure. But a body, I mean, a penis that's 10 times an individual's body length is fairly remarkable, I think. Right, guys? <laughs> Francois Jacob said that nature is a tinker, not a divine artificer. And what he meant by that was that essentially sort of selection has to work on what's there. It's not creating all these incredible new structures de novo, but it basically takes parts that are there and reworks them into the things that we see in organisms around us. So remember I told you that the flatworms that we first talked about sort of mated kind of normally. But there's some flatworms that actually try to inseminate each other by piercing the body wall of the other flatworm with their penis, or their two penises in some cases. So they've got these little stylets, they're really sharp, and they pierce each other and inject each other with sperm. So the pierced worm becomes the mother, why, 
wouldn't an individual want to be inseminated? Well, it turns out, again, it has to do with the cost. It actually is cheaper to inseminate a female than to basically use up those eggs, which are more expensive. Here's some flatworms, penis fencing. So right there, if you look at, oh, it disappeared. See that little white, those little white things right there? Those are their penis, that's the, the, this guy's penis. Now this guy here, up, oh, he rears up, there's his penises, and he gets on top, and you can't really tell when consummation has happened here. <laughs> but anyway, so this is, this is flatworm penis fencing. It's a scuba diving, oh, there you can see, up. Oh, Scuba diving spectator sport. Let's talk about ducks. So even our sea ducks here, so when you go out to Commencement Bay and you see golden eyes and you see scoters, those guys actually breed in, the fre in, in fresh water. But I'm going to count them as marine. So ducks are the only birds with penises. And some birds, like this ruddy duck right here, have penises as long as their bodies. There's some birds, there's a, there's a South American duck that has a penis that's two and a half times as long as its body. So the penis of a duck is, is filled with lymphatic fluid really rapidly. And the male penis is corkscrewed in a clockwise fashion. So you would think, right, that the female reproductive tract would also be corkscrewed in the same way, but it's not. It's actually corkscrewed in the opposite direction. Why is that? It also has a whole bunch of blind sacs that come off the side. Well, it turns out that in ducks, over a third often, in some species, over a third of all matings that happen are forced copulations. So some people call them rape or forced copulation. So these males are brutal, and they're chasing females around, trying to mate willy-nilly. Years ago, people thought, oh, the females have no choice about choosing mates. They're sort of the passive recipients of these males. Well, it turns out that that's not so. So sexual conflict, where males are trying basically to increase their fitness, but females would like to choose which males actually fertilize her eggs, um, ends up leading to some of these differences. So the idea is, so this is a Muscovy duck, and this is 10 times slow, slow down 10 times. So they basically can just um, extend their penis and end up mating with these females. So the question is why? So females want to choose their mate. It turns out, so... Uh, Patricia Brennan ended up making a glass model of a female reproductive tract. She made a bunch of them. She made some of them that corkscrewed clockwise, like the male, some of them that didn't corkscrew at all, and some of them that corkscrewed counterclockwise. It turned out that it took the male, basically the, the counterclockwise, counterclockwise reproductive tract, it took the male a much longer time to get his penis in all the way up to basically sort of her sort of the, where, the, where the eggs are, where fertilization would occur. The other thing that would happen is that the, then the penis would end up getting sort of sidetracked into these blind sacs. And then female ducks eject sperm. And so Brennan's idea is that females are actually sort of choosing which males to allow in and which males not to allow in because when they relax their re reproductive tract, then the penis can actually extend all the way up into the reproductive tract. So it's a wild story and explains ducks, penises. So finally, the last, one of the last things I want to talk about are baculi. So I don't know if any of you knew this, but a lot of mammals have penis bones. Turns out that all carnivores have them. Turns out that all bats have them, all rodents have them, and almost all primates have them, except for humans. So the question that people have asked for years is what's it for? And in the, the way of science, right, we, we don't have a really good answer for that. There's three reasons that have been proposed. One is that it's for basically long, for species where there's long duration copulation. Another one is that 
it's um, used to stimulate ovulation, and then um, those are the two. Those are the two most reasonable ones. So the question is, what's it for? So to give you an idea of a little baculum diversity. So this is a harbor seal baculum right here from the museum. So you can see it's it's relatively large. This right here is the largest baculum in mammals. This is a walrus baculum, okay? And so the idea is that for basically for animals that sort of need rapid erections, this baculum really helps. But we don't really know exactly what it's for. But one of the strangest things is that all primates have baculi except for humans. And this led to a paper that came out a few years ago. So if you imagine sort of hunter-gatherer cultures, they actually know the diversity of critters that's out there. They know what the morphology is and what the anatomy is. And it turned out that in Hebrew there was no word for rib. And so this paper suggested actually that it was Adam's baculum that was taken to make Eve. And one of my colleagues and then one of my son's friends in high school actually wrote little poems to celebrate this. So, there once was an old guy named Jonah who was born with an osseous bona. God took it away to make woman one day and it was never returned to its owner. So that's by Dennis Paulson, who some of you may know. So, sort of premier naturalist. And then Caroline Allen, uh, who goes to Foss High School, she actually, so this all, this all came about because a friend of mine who teaches biology got a, ba a raccoon baculum as a gift from his wife. And so he's telling his kids about it and asked some questions. So one of, one of his students wrote this. There once was a man named Adam from whom was created a madam. From Adam's own... A a bone did God pick, and since then our men haven't had them. <laughs> so, okay, enough with penises already. One of the things that you may think, you know, big is, big is better, right? So these elephant, these giant elephant seals, right, dominate matings. If you look at salmon, right, if you've watched salmon spawn, you get these large hooked hook-jawed males, and they're fighting each other, and only the biggest males end up mating. Um, midshipmen, same thing, like the big males get the mating. But in lots and lots of species, species it turns out that they're all alternative strategies, alternative male strategies. And in all of these, there are sneaker males. So they're males that don't grow as fast. They may end up devoting a lot more energy to, to um, gonad, to testes. And so jack salmon come up earlier. So rather than spending, you know, for in Chinook, rather than spending four or five years out in the ocean, they come back after a year. They basically lurk in the shadows when a male and female male are mating. They dart out, release their sperm over the female's eggs, and then go lurk in the shadows. Elephant seals, you have these, these young males who basically are called sneaker males who end up sort of lurking on the edges of territories trying to mate with females. And it's the same thing with midshipmen. In, in midshipmen, the uh, testes of the sneaker males are nine times larger relative to their body size than in the territorial males. And finally, cephalopods, so octopi, squid, and nautilus, they end up packing their sperm in packages called spermatophores. And the way they're, they're de basically deposited or given to females varies among species. In a lot of, in a lot of squid, the males will end up, take, they have a special arm, they'll deposit a spermatophore, a package of sperm, underneath the female squid's mantle, and then she actually will take these sperm packets and she'll decide which one she likes the best, and with her, te with her tentacles, she'll actually break them open, holding her eggs in her arms, and release the sperm over her eggs. But one, one of the cephalopods that is sort of the wildest, it's kind of like guided cruise missiles, is the paper nautilus. And so the paper nautilus actually releases one of its arms with a spermatophore, and then that swims to a female. So it's kind of like this guided missile, right? You're just like, okay, I've got, here's my sperm, and off it goes. <laughs>